Welcome to the Vocation Creation Podcast, helping you create the work you can't wait to wake up to do. Get inspired by people who have designed their own unique vocation and entrepreneurial experts sharing valuable information on starting and growing your business. Now, here's Jennifer Wenzel with Vocation Creation. Welcome to the Vocation Creation Podcast, Karen Merks, an artist from England who has a unique style and a very unique product that she has started offering to her clients and customers that is absolutely magical and uh, we'll be talking about in just a moment. Hi, Karen. Hi. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, listeners might notice that you don't have a, a traditional uh, English accent. Where did no. you grow up? I'm originally from Holland, the Netherlands. And they still hear it that I'm not from here. And especially the, the area I, where I live, Essex. Yeah, okay. it's, it's greater London. So living in the city isn't really possible. If you want to live affordable here, like in, any, in every big city in the world, like London, Amsterdam, etc., then you need big pockets. Ah, yeah. Not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, artists aren't known, generally speaking, overall for being the wealthiest people on the face of the earth, right? <laughs> but you are doing well for yourself with, uh, with your new product. I'm starting. I'm starting. Yes, there is a high thing about artists and selling their art and living from it, which is ridiculous. Because if you look into the art history, there were numerous artists who lived from their artists. And those we still know like Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, is a, they had a very sure. specific why. Rembrandt, my favorite, my idol. Like uh, also, by the way, da Vinci and uh, Michelangelo. But they were business people. They were business people. So there is this really weird idea that if, as an artist, well, I know this from the Netherlands, you need to live on an attic, cold, being able to just hold on to life, have maybe a Patreon somewhere who gives you some money for... It's absurd. Because if you know what oil paint costs nowadays, the canvases, what they cost, the brushes that you need, you need a good income and you need to sell your paintings for a good price, otherwise you can't even paint. So true. So let's talk about how you do that. Tell me a little bit about how you got started in the specific style. If you could describe it for our listeners, the work that you're doing lately and how you came to that work. That would be lovely. I paint portraits as a story, which means that I'm highly intuitive. I listen to people, to their story, and I start with a meditation before I go into the portrait itself. And I can see more than that they see within themselves. So I touch upon their authenticity. And how did I came to that? I was always fascinated by portraits. So are many artists, but there was something that attracted me and I found out that after I hit rock bottom, and it's just two years ago, I knew that the only thing that would help me was my art. So what I did was I made a sketch of my self-portrait. I made a self-portrait. I put it aside at first. But the next day, I picked it up and I looked at it. I really started looking at it, and, and I cried, because that's the first time that I looked at myself in a way that I never had done before. And that was so profound. And I realized that I had painted portraits of other artists and other people. My own self-portraits were always distorted somehow. I thought, that's artistic. That's, I can do that because I'm an artist. No, it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with not being able to look and at myself and see who I am for what I am. So it really deeply touched within me. It touched my authenticity. I got reconnected with who I am. And from that moment on, I knew my why. That's why I paint portraits. And your why is one of the most important things of a business. 
And people don't po- buy my portraits because they're beautiful portraits. They buy or they commission me for portraits because of my why. Oh, that's beautifully put. And for people who are uh, watching this on video, there is a portrait beside you in, in the frame that is stunning. Was that a commissioned portrait? No, it wasn't. I'm working on a project that's an educational project where I want to have African people and people of color from the LGBTQI plus community, especially women. I portray them, make their story, and I want to make some type of letter with it for lessons. It's for education to teach children and teenagers about LGBTQI+, that it is very normal, that it is not only for us as white people, but also for people of color. We are all the same. People Mm -hmm. need to know that. And I've heard too much that my friends were told, you can't be gay because you're black. That's something only white. And I had, this is ridiculous. And this is notoriously wrong. So... I decided, okay, I'm going to make a project that is around that. And this is Nina Simone. Of course, that's why her face looks familiar. (laughs) Yeah, this is Nina Simone. And I absolutely love this portrait. It's not not quite finished, but I'm close. And um, it's so vibrant and there's just soul yeah. shining straight it is, out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to catch her soul because this is a very, she was bisexual, although her most of the time she had a very um, abusive relationship with a man. She was also bipolar mm. and <laughs> she went to the Netherlands and friends took her to the hospital and they diagnosed it there. She got medication and was told like, over time, your memory will deteriorate, your cognitive abilities and your your physical abilities, like playing the piano. She is a classically trained uh, piano player. Um, and that is horrific. That is horrific. But if you see her, like, this is such a vibrant, beautiful person. And, and, and I, you've captured I feel that, that I have really dived deep into it that's another thing sometimes i make this and it takes me time to portray because they don't want to get portrayed and some people just are like here i am do me pay me and uh, of course this is from a photo but i can do live sessions too yeah so i know about uh, autonomy etc of figure face etc the whole bone structure i can tell i can tell by look i'm I'm not a trained artist's eye but but yeah i just love that painting (laughs) and i've seen some of your other work since we talked previously uh, before this call and i know that you've branched into a new way of presenting your work and a new way of working with people who commission you for art and that is through a book that includes uh this really unique I, I've never seen this before from an artist it's typography it's basically a portraiture of a person in typography from the quotes yeah. that you draw out of them is that a good way to describe that is it a good way to describe it yeah I'm I'm also a graphic designer and typography was always something that I loved to do and before computers existed <laughs> I made things in typography That was cutting, pasting, making composition, coloring, going to the copy shop, then make tons of copies, then started cutting again, and etc. So you made these layered typographical compositions. Yeah, that's why Photoshop existed, because people were doing that in real life. (laughs) And then they figured out a way to create it digitally. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. And I like the handwork, to be honest. But what I do is... I'm working on a commission now and people tell me their story. And as persons, the longer you live, you have, we have millions of stories. Some time, tell me their life story. Some tell me a part of, of, of something that really, yeah, like was a, important for them. Mm-hmm. Like a, a um, defining moment in their life. A very defining moment in their life, whatever. I record that and then I transcribe, but I do not edit. 
I need the raw emotion. When I have transcribed it, I'm going to type it up. I make it into proportions like, okay, uh, I want so many pages and, I, and this fits together and this. And, and then pure on my intuition, I take a specific word or a specific sentence, which I illustrate. And uh, the pages scan, are, are scanned in. I scan them on a high resolution. So they're handmade typography that I draw, uh, color, etc. And then I assemble the book. And then the page with the text, because it's one part is the typographical illustration, the other side is the text of their story. And that gets the color. I pick a color, a dominant color from the illustration. And that page is that color. So you get a very colorful book of your story. And that really makes people proud of who they are that really makes them proud of their story they never looked at their own story that way it's so hard to That's, describe in words but you've done a really good job it's that the result that you showed me uh before it's it's it, it you, you use the word colorful and yes it's colorful it's visual it's visceral it's very immediate you just get this really sense of who the person is just through literally illustrating the words that they spoke this is not necessarily including uh, a facial portrait although i know you do that as well but just illustrating the story in the very literal sense of illustrating the words that they're using mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the person really comes through it was astounding yeah and that's how they experience it themselves I am now on book number three that I make. I just did this. I offered it first with the portrait as a, a value above and beyond. And because I just did a course for art marketing, she said, my mentor said, but this can be something that stands alone on its own. So I started that. And when I do these stories, when I transcribe them, for me, they're unique. For the people who live with them for years, for their lives or whatever, it's not unique because they rehash them constantly. They tell it or they leave parts out because it's not something they want to share. But when they see it back into a book, one of my customers said, this is my legacy. The other one said, wow, what you did with the words, it's so much love. This changes perceptions and it, change, and it brings hope. Wow. I'm and as an of, artist. I'm so proud of my yeah. story. And, she, and that makes me proud. That is, I think, the most important thing you can do as an artist. That is bring and enrich other people's lives through this. Because it's the same as if I look at someone else's business. I can oversee everything. But when you're in it, you don't oversee your life. You don't oversee and that's what I do. I pick out something. And um, the specific book you talk about is about the twins. That was a very special project. There, something happened there that I didn't even understand, understood in the beginning. That was that the boy, that the, they were born as twins and they were born way too early. And then the boy passed away 14 days after birth. And the woman is uh, in her 40s now and she told me her story and she had to go through things in life it was not always easy but she is she has arrived now in a way she's happy and yeah she's doing what she wants to do etc and with that came the portrait i had to do a portrait because that was the commission the strange thing in that was that I woke up one morning and I, and I heard this message, you have to do a double portrait, and I didn't understand why. Even though I had felt a, an energy around her, it still was like, but why? Because she is alone, why should I? And I did it anyway. And then the reaction of her and her parents, because I gave their brother a face. And the, mom, the, the father wrote me, we'll never lose him again. That's of course, this is how he would have looked at this age. 
That is so moving for a family to see a portrait of their child who had not had the opportunity to live that life that his sister had. Yeah, that is. And with that came the book. And when they came and collected the, uh, so I revealed the painting and I revealed the book. And there's always emotion. So that's another thing. As an art business, you do not sell a product. You don't sell painting on canvas. I don't sell words in a book. No, I sell emotion. It's just to totally different. Totally different. So when they came here and I revealed it, there were tears. And the first night she said she took the book with her to her bed. It was next. Because she had to read her own story. Wow. Wow, I've never read my own story. And that's... And see it in this way. Yeah. Are you... Are you quite looking forward to increasing this particular uh, part of your artistic output? Is this something that you're very, that you're really looking forward to growing? It sounds like it's a really emotionally invested process. Uh, is it something that you'll be able to grow into a major product and still remain fresh with it? <laughs> Uh, yes, I have many ideas that I want to do. I like the whole process of handmade anyway. Of course, these books are printed on demand. I, I make the book, I design the book. It gets to a printer on demand. I get a copy for for review. It, I take out the, the typos that I make when I have typed it up. That happens. I see if the settings is okay, if it printed okay. And if all is, I order it again and, and then send it to the customer. Or they come with me uh, at my place and I reveal it. I definitely look forward to it. I'm working currently on a very difficult project, but a very important project. And that is about survivors' domestic abuse I work with two girls who live in America they are from the Dominican Republic and they went through hell and backwards they were um, sexually abused uh, in their youth but also later by their first boyfriends and they have their own they have their own organization time of butterflies and we work together so they gave me their stories and I'm transcribing them. COVID has made a bit of a gap into it, but I'm on it again. I have to transcribe their stories. I had to tell my own story, which wasn't easy. I thought I went through that and uh, then I read it out loud and I still couldn't. I had, oh, wow. I didn't realize that it was still so fresh. But it is necessary. And we do it. So you so are definitely. So we're doing this. Yeah. I was going to say you are a person who does not shy away from deep emotion and no. difficult situations no. at all. No. no, not at all. No, I, I I believe that. I believe that as an artist, you feel deeper emotions anyway. And I don't like to shy away from them. I never have. No. So, a no. question for you. Business is difficult enough as it is. There's a lot that you need to learn and keep up on. There's a lot of developments, technologically speaking, and you're dealing with things that are, are very emotional. And some of them are very happy emotions, and some of them can be very uh, challenging emotions. How do you keep yourself both moving forward when things get difficult and continuing to develop as a business person and as an artist? How do you move forward through all that? I have a, an, a very strong routine in meditation. That is for me is always the go-to. And when things are a bit tough, I go and f for a walk, a long walk, to clear my head. So those are personal things that I do. And further, I, I've done just, I just did, I started it in April, of course, the Profit Canvas by Alexis Fedor, which is all about art marketing. And I'm in the process of doing that. 
engagement. You see a lot of things out there. Yes, you can sell your art here, you can sell, but this really deeply goes into what marketing is and how it works. And also specifically for artists. And not only painters, but also writers and dancers. And she's an artist herself, so she understands the artist. She loves artists and she's an incredible teacher and mentor. You have to set up your, your tech stuff. That's not much, but you need to have your tech, your mail list, your platforms where you can engage. You have to make a plan four weeks ahead. You have to uh, write. You have to write your own stories where you have your headline and your call to action, etc. Always you have to find your why. I already had my why, but a lot of artists do not have a why. They have, but they don't know yet. They have to explore what their why do you do what you do. And that is not just something superficial that is deep within you. And that's why I don't bother with other uh, portrait painters that I'm that there is competition because there isn't. And people come right. from me for my why and, and not for because I'm a better portrait artist or whatever. Right, it's what absolutely drives you. Or that they go to you. someone else because those people are better. It's not in, there is no competition if you have a why. So how I do this, I just keep my sanity <laughs> by meditation. It really is necessary for me. Next to that, it's self-growth always. And I read about business people who are highly successful. And when you read, I just finished a biography of uh, Richard Branson. And if you read that, he didn't become a billionaire overnight. My right. God, he, has his, he had his struggles and his, but he always kept going. And he always knew, okay, this, well, then we have to take another path to get there anyway. And that gives you the feeling like, oh, okay. Ah, now I understand. Okay, I will never give up. If it doesn't go in this path, then I take the other path. I right. take a detour, but I will come there anyway. So, Keeping the end in mind and just allowing the how you get there to be open to iteration and experimentation and yeah. adjustment. <laughs> yeah. And that also don't put yourself down when you fail. I made a mistake in the beginning. I was just in this course and lockdown. The whole world just shut down in, in a week. And uh, then you have to pivot. And I had like, pivot, okay, what do I do? Portraits, uh, art books. And someone said to me, you, do, you also are a teacher and you have made courses. You have your platform, or, uh, online art education. Why don't you create something for parents who have their children at home? Fantastic An art idea. class. So I did. I made a, an art class uh, set for seven days. You can do that. You can do it for as long as you want. For children age five to 80. Oh, that's wonderful. And they create... It's also for diversity. So I made the ocelot, the okra ocelot, the plantain parrot, the beagle bagel. Now, all kinds of animals <laughs> that way that you can draw. The tie-in with cultural foods. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's adorable. And I, had, and I had a few people who liked it. And who opened my letter. So I did the whole process that I learned with the uh, profit canvas, everything with the four part sales letters, etc., everything. And they opened everything, but they didn't buy. And they had like, why is this? Yeah, because not all ideal clients, if, if you have 100 ideal clients, there will be maybe five people who buy something from you. That's a realization. You think... Right. Okay, I have my ideal clients. They all buy from me. Not because they're not ready or the time is not right. or They can later on, but not necessarily when you want it at that That's time. That's a very good point. They may have a competing priority at this point, but as long as you stay in touch, if they are truly your ideal client and they really resonate with what you're doing, it will be the right time eventually. You just have to exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just remember that yeah. that this exact moment may not be the right moment, but it sure could be next month or next year. That could be, and the and the course is still online, and you can enroll when whenever you want. The price isn't high, 
I'd used a very specific COVID price. So it's easy to do it. It's fun to do it. You can do it together with your children. You can do it with your granddad or your grandma or your grandparents or alone or with your friends, whatever. But it is fun to do. And, what what um, supplies do you need to, to take this class and to oh, create the everything art? you have in the house. I, I, if you have uh, colored pencils, take colored pencils. If you have felt tips, use that. If you have paint, you can use that. You nice. need paper. But, yeah, I you think know, everyone has it, paper. <laughs> take it from the printer. And a pencil, of course, you need to, to draw. That sounds great. I'm going to have to give that a try. So, so. it's that's a, a thing so i that was my pivot and it didn't work out and i had now what so i just this is a strange time it is. and the only thing i do at the moment is i emphasize on the art books also the portraits because they are dear to my heart but mostly the the, the art books and i know and i keep engaging with people moving forward and i know you set a price for the art books and, and your artwork, your original paintings, that if I remember right, you said it was a little difficult to actually accept that your work had that much value, but you are charging a very good uh, price for these pieces moving forward. Can we talk a little bit about the challenges with making those decisions on pricing and what that means? Yeah, pricing is, and, and especially for artists, is always difficult. Um, people tend to look at other artists or what they price or galleries or whatever. What I found out is that as soon as you have sold a painting, when you revealed a portrait, in my case that was when it started, I revealed the portrait and the book. And I had a price, set a price for it, which wasn't a price that it should have been. People told me this is. <laughs> not enough by long shot I said but my feeling tells me that, that this is good enough for me at the moment you need to be comfortable with it because if you're not the energy isn't right mm -hmm. so the moment I asked do you want to uh, buy it of course even if it had been uh, more than you ask me now that moment I knew, also with all the emotions that came with it, I sell emotion. And it immediately raised my feeling that I have a real value to deliver. So for now, an art book on its own without a portrait is 500 pounds. That is about $620 or something. If you want a portrait with it, a portrait drawing in the book, it's about 1000 Watercolor is 2500 and oil paintings with art book starts from $3,000 uh, pounds, yeah, great British pounds. Wonderful. And yeah. As, and I, I feel that that is definitely reflecting the value that people do get out of the work that you do because it is such, uh, like you said, revelatory and emotion-based process. They buy not only the physical product, but the process and the emotions that come with it. And I agree Absolutely. that you Absolutely. need to value that just as much yeah. as the raw costs of the canvas and the paint and then just add a little bit of profit. <laughs> That's not how it works. No. Exactly. And, and there is another thing which is really important and that was i was taught that i'm don't tap into the energy of your customer because you can make something which is really valuable and you think but they can't buy that don't go there it's not true it's not true if they need it and with that also want it they will do everything possible Oh yes, I'm so sure they we start all... their own crowdfunding. They they start saving up. I have a payment plan. Oh nice. Make an agreement, and you pay me monthly. That's for me. That's recurrent income. Yes. That is all. Oh, all oh, everything is possible. But, it's just, but as soon as business owner, as you create your things, and that doesn't matter what you create. Um, but if you start to think, oh, no, I need to price it this way because otherwise they won't buy because they can't afford it, 
wrong way to go. Don't tap into that energy. Because as soon as you are thinking that, you get those people. Yeah, That's and how I'm, energy works. I'm sure that we is, can all. That is simply how energy works. But everyone, no matter what product you have, no matter what you do in business, we all have to do with this. Yeah. yeah. And every one of us can think of a time where we did not have a lot of extra money, but something came along that we needed to have and we made it happen. Not, not a, a need such as like shelter or food, but a need as in I see this particular product and service, and I know that I need it in my life right now. I had and, it. Yeah. I had it with the profit canvas. I participated in the ten days challenge with Alexis, and I knew if I want to move forward with my business and how to find my ideal clients and how to do this, etc. Et then I need this. This is what I need at this moment. And she has a payment plan, so I can do that. That's wonderful. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible. The universe always has your back. <laughs> so that's what I say, think anyway. Let's say you had an extra uh, 10,000 pounds that just dropped into your lap with the caveat that you had to spend it to market or um, advertise your business. How would you spend that 10,000 pounds? I would definitely go a level up with Alexis Fedor. She has a, a group where she uh, personally and uh, privately mentors. I would absolutely love that. And that is about six months. I think she has extended it for this time because of COVID also for a year. So people who are in it now have a year. Otherwise, it's six months. And the other part for Facebook advertising because that really works if you do it well. <laughs> and let's just say that your income stream completely stopped, just out of the blue. There's no income coming in. How would you market or advertise your business with zero budget? That's what I do now. Oh, it's not true that I don't have income because I have commissions, and I, yes. but I don't pay for marketing right. because I have a mailing list that is uh, free for t till so many uh, till you reach a certain amount of uh, email subscribers i use instagram facebook and uh, linkedin and i just engage there you those platforms are free and you can use them you when you go into advertising on facebook you need money but you don't have to so what i do is organically growing my my mail list and I do clients because that's that's very important that you have a mail list. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, they can be gone suddenly and then you lose everything. So when you build your email list, it's not. And people can subscribe on my email list through my website, through uh, Facebook, uh, through Instagram. So that's a very good yeah, point. That's, that's something that you own. That's your own property. That's you're, your own property. Yes, yeah. you're the landlord of that property, not the <laughs> exactly. not the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. lessee. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, up until now, that doesn't cost me any money, which is very it's important. What, it's it's what we call organically growing, which takes a bit longer, but putting seeds is very important in this time anyway. I agree. If you had a piece of advice to someone just starting out, perhaps another uh, artist, perhaps a visual artist who has not yet taken the leap to grow, to start or grow their business in the way that they wanted to, what would you advise to someone in that position? Start with your why. That's the most important thing. Yeah. There's so many artists and they use social media and they all drop the art in a big ocean and then they hope that they will get people who find them and buy from them that's called hope marketing doesn't work and so you have these sites Asachi and Saatchi where you can place your art that's like fishing in a pond and you have the chance that you sell there is so incredibly small 
and then it also costs you a lot, costs you more. What I do is that what I, I earn all. I don't pay 60% or 40% to a gallery owner or whatever. But first, the most important thing is why. Look for your why do you do what you do? What is and not superficial, driver? not like I'm an artist, I, I create and therefore I am. That is so general. That is, I can say that, you can say that, everyone can say that. No, it needs to be specific to you. Why do you do what you do? Same like me. The interest of por for portraits was always there till I found my why. Oh, I paint portraits because it connects me with who I am. And it made me realize that I can stay true to who I am because I am good enough. So that's my why. Well, that's, that's the most important thing. And really. everybody's why will be different. I spoke to an artist who will also be on this podcast and she is driven by adding color to the world. She has a <laughs> very colorful uh, geometric mosaic style with animals and her work is stunningly beautiful like yours too it's very both of your work is very eye-catching and I think it is because there is such a purpose behind it it's not just I'm painting something it's no, I'm no. painting something that is speaking who I am and how I see the world yeah yeah so I definitely I, very much believe in that. And it's one, wonderful to hear you say that. It's a, it's a process to figure out what your why is. But when you find it, that is who you truly are. And that is why you do what you do, why you exist, so to speak, yeah. to do whatever that is. And it could be a small thing or it could be a very big thing in the world. But if it truly drives you and it's authentic, it will show in your work. Exactly. And the, and the fun thing is, because I'm an artist, I'm a classically trained musician, I'm an academic, and all, everything I do is based on my purpose in this life. So I not only make my art the way I do, as I told with the art books of your story or portrait as your story, I always am working, I also am working currently on setting up my foundation, Wings of Freedom Art Center. Like the women I talked about and work I collaborate with, they have times of uh, time of butterflies and um, working on my uh, Wings of Freedom Art Center for people who survived domestic, well, abuse. To give art workshops, to give them dance, theater workshops, to give them the art of self-defense, to be able to give them uh, quests where they study deep with, about themselves through Mind Valley. And that's really for self-growth, to step back into their power, to really step back into their power and, and take full control of their own lives again. That's another thing that is um, very dear to my heart. And that's also my why, because all those people who were abused couldn't stay true to who they really are. They live, they were lived in a life that was set by terms of, a, of someone else. And if they didn't walk in that path, they were beaten to pulp often. Or, yeah, worse. I was really shocked when I read a uh, rapport by the UN that in 2017 alone 87,000 women were murdered murdered by their spouse, ex-spouse, family member and that's horrific and that's only women it happens to men too transgender people are suffering terribly so then I decided it's not only for women, it's also for people. That is women, men, LGBTQI+, trans, but also children, because children oh suffer a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm so moved by what you're saying, and it makes me think of that very famous quote that you uh, have to be the change that you want to see in the world. And 
you are living and breathing and creating that change, which is uh, quite powerful. Thank you. It's at least what I want. I read a very important quote that we are not here on this planet for ourselves. We are here uh, to touch the hearts of other people, to touch other people. That is the most important thing. And once you realize that, everything in your business, your business is, my business is who I am. It's what I wake up for in the morning very early. It is, and, and especially when you have your why, because then you know why you do it. It's not because I want to be the famous artist. It's not because I want to hang in a museum or a gallery. No, I want to enrich people's lives, help them with their connection with themselves and let them see their authentic self, love themselves. This is all some very heavy uh, emotional stuff that we've been talking about. So just really quickly to uh, wrap it up on a bit of a lighter note, I believe very strongly in the concept of your work also being your play as well. And I feel like even though you are dealing with some very emotional topics and purposes in your life, I also get the sense that you feel a sense of play and a sense of fun in your work as well. And I see that come out as well. It's not just, I don't want listeners to get the feeling that Karen's work is dark or heavy because no, it's not. No, no, it is no, so not light and it's, joyous. It's <laughs> colorful and that needs to be colorful and it is play. But that is what you, when you do what you love to do, it's not work. It's not work. There will always so be the, the day, hard parts of the job. It's never going to be all unicorns and bubbles all day long, but it's work that you love to do. It's work which you love to do. And then, it, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's play. And you need to have that play. You need to be childlike within that. If you don't, you lose that sense of fun and that sense of. Also going deep, because if you listen to children, they go deeper than you think. And they do it in a very joyful way. So no, for me, I have portraits that are, this one behind my myself, it's not ready yet. And I leave it this way because it's, um, well, there comes something more, but it's, uh, the colors are not uh, fleshy. But I have very colorful portraits. Yeah, definitely. And so, how and do the you books ensure, too, by the way? Oh yeah. yeah, that's one thing. When you showed me your typography book, it was, it was so joyous and happy. I just got that sense of, and and it might be the person that you were doing it for. Maybe she is a particular joyous or happy person. But at the very least, your art, as it comes through, seems extremely colorful, happy, and hopeful. That's my whole. But that's the whole idea behind it. No matter what kind of story it is, it also always needs to be happy and hopeful so that you can embrace your story and be proud of it. And you don't, you're not proud if you have a dark, (laughs) a dark book. No, it needs to be uh, colorful. Colors are so important. Colors are so important. Colors and light in our lives. And if you don't see them, but you can see, I bring color in your story, even if it's a dark story. I make I make it colorful so that you can be hopeful about it and be happy about it and proud yes. about it. Yeah, and and the work that it takes to come through the other side and be able to tell the story. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Karen, where can people connect with you online? They can co- go to a Facebook page. That is facebook.com slash Kali Studios. You can go to Instagram.com uh, Kali underscore studios. You can go to my website, karenmerix.co.uk. Wonderful. And we'll put those links in the show notes so that people yeah, can easily get I will give them to you. There. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that uh, I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? Yeah, some people ask me why I want art as a business and why I take the entrepreneurial path because they're not used to that 
when it concerns artists. But I think I was always self-employed. As a classically trained musician, I was self-employed. I had a, a minor job in a music school in, in Amsterdam, but it was so part-time, but I had students at home. I played in ensembles. I, I made music theater for children, little children. Later, I opened a graphic design studio for myself. I made all kinds of websites and house styles, etc. My, with my university degree, I helped people as a tutor, mentor with their thesis, proposals, bachelor and PhD, um, master and PhD. So it's has always been me as a self-employed person. But I never knew what a business was. There were things in the business like the marketing, but also the finances. How do you do that? And where do you look at the pricing, etc. Also for musicians. Well, we talked about it. That's a hard thing. That has changed. I like every aspect of my business. And for now, I do it on my own because I'm not that far yet that I can afford to have people doing things for me. But it cer certainly will come because I just found out that I'm a creator. So I have a lot of ideas, but I need people around me that in a team that help me get my goals. Yes, the implementers. <laughs> I need the implementers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think you'll end up basically outsourcing obviously you'll keep the art to yourself what would in your ideal business what would you outsource to others eventually i think that the copywriting i will outsource the ideas will be me. I, i've done that now because i know someone is a writer and she helped me i paid her for that so that's my first outsource but um, the copywriting probably the implementation on my web on my website but also on my social media the posts mm -hmm. so i make them and they schedule it for me the overview finances where we are maybe in time also investments etc very important that i have people who i can trust who can uh, help me with that Sure. So like an online business manager, I think that's a person that hits all those roles from my understanding of, of online business management. A person yeah, who's I, an can, I can also understand that I have different people who fit in a team like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah it's... And of course, trustees for my foundation so that I can be the CEO and work the things up. It sounds like you have a wonderful future ahead. <laughs> I work towards it. Yeah, I hope so. Karen Merckx, thank you so much for your time today. I am absolutely delighted to uh, learn more about your work and to shine a spotlight on the vocation that you have created for yourself. So thank you very much for your time and being here. Uh, thank you so much for letting me be here and letting me talk about my passion. Thanks for listening to the Vocation Creation Podcast. Join me each week for inspiration and motivation to do the work you can't wait to wake up to. I'm Jennifer Wenzel. Find more at vocationcreation.com.